Hello. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we can learn about poker or from poker about risk. So a little bit about myself. I started off my uh, life, uh, I guess, well, not my life, but my uh, adult life uh, studying cognitive science at uh, University of Pennsylvania in their PhD program. I had a National Science Foundation fellowship and was on my way to a life in academics, being a professor, hopefully at a place like this. Uh, and right at the end, I decided to take a little bit of time off. And during that time off, I figured out that when you lose your fellowship, you need to make some money, uh, <laughs> which is a little bit of a reality. Oh, I have rent to pay, and nobody's giving me any money now. So my brother, who at the time was already a professional poker player, suggested to me uh, that I might want to play poker. And at the time, I had uh, moved to Montana with my then husband. Uh, and there was, turned out, a poker game about 30, 35 minutes away in Billings, Montana. Uh, and he said, well, why don't you go there? I'll send you a little bit of money, and you can see how you do with it. Uh, so I thought, well, that's a good thing to do in the meantime while I'm trying to sort of figure out what am I going to do now that I'm done studying? Do I actually want to become a professor? And I like to say that the meantime turned into 20 years. Uh, I feel like I'm still a little bit in the meantime. Uh, and I'm sure that a career in poker is exactly what the National Foundation, Science Foundation had in mind for me. Uh, but anyway, I did that for um, 20 years. Uh, I did you know, pretty well. I won a World Series of Poker bracelet, tournament champion, some other things. Uh, but I realized pretty quickly, uh, as I was doing that, that there was a big merging of what I had studied in cognitive science with sort of the exercise and decision making uh, that was happening when I was playing poker. Uh, and that's because of this definition of poker. Poker is a game of decision making under conditions of uncertainty over time. That happens to be the same definition of game theory, which isn't coincidental, because game theory was based on the game of poker by a guy named John von Neumann. Uh, so if you look at the behavior of people at, po at the poker table, you can actually learn a lot about human decision making. So when I got asked to talk about risk, I thought, well, this is really exciting, because risk is built into the definition. It's the uncertainty piece. And uncertainty is actually something that poker players think about a lot. We think about risk, we think about uncertainty, luck, skill, uh, how to manage risk. So I thought, aha, that's what I'm going to talk to you about today now that I've been asked to talk about risk. I'm going to talk about risk management. So in order to do that, I've got to get a few definitional things aside, so hopefully you'll bear with me. So the first thing is we have to understand, in order to understand risk, what expected value is. Expected value is the theoretical net positive or negative of a given event over time. So let me give you a concrete example. So here's a simple expected value calculation. In 2004, I played in the Tournament of Champions. That was a winner-take-all $2 million prize event. There were 10 of us in the tournament. So if you assume we were all of equal skill, which is a bad assumption, there were lots of people who were much better than me in that, uh, then each of us would win the uh, tournament 10% of the time, because there's 10 of us. So my expected value would have been $200,000. Uh, we all couldn't think about a coin flip, so heads and tails are 50-50. So let's say that I were to flip with one of you in the audience, and I said, if you call it right, I'm going to give you $20. And if you call it wrong, you have to give me 10. That's a net positive of $10 for you uh, when you win versus you lose, but you're only going to win it half the time, so we have to multiply that by a half. So your expected value is $5 a flip. But that's a theoretical number, because obviously, if you're winning 20 when you win, and you're losing 10 when you lose, you never actually get handed $5. That's just the theoretical value of each flip. And that brings us to the next thing when we think about risk, which is volatility, which leads to the concept of luck, which is how much variation there is around this expected value, the theoretical earn. So I can give you a, a picture of that. So this is for a coin flip. Uh, what you can see is uh, out here at what we call the tails, the edges are sort of very unlikely events. So if you flip a coin 10 times, it's very rare that you'll have zero heads. And very rare, obviously, equally rare, that you'll have uh, 10 heads. And mostly, you're going to have five heads and five tails. But that's just going to be the average result. And on any given time, while I can tell you the probability that you'll have five heads or four heads or three heads or two heads or one head, we don't actually know for that given time. Right? So we're, we're living in this uncertain world where we have an idea of what the average is, but we don't know what it's going to be 
uh, on a given time. So what that distribution looks like tells us what the variation around that central value is, right? So that poker players have to think about that a lot. So that brings us to the idea of rich risk management, which is uh, and, uh, where you ask yourself, how much should you bet on or invest in an event proportional to the total resources you have? Because you're trying to maximize the probability that you realize this amount of money that you're supposed to make, so you're $5 on a coin flip, but you want to do it before you go broke. Right? So you can imagine, even if you're making $5 every coin flip, because I'm giving you $20 for every $10 you lose, you wouldn't want to bet all the money you have in the world on one coin flip, because half the time you would just go broke. So we think about you know, what's our tolerance for going broke, and then we can do these calculations of what percentage of the total resources I have for a poker player that would be money can I bet and really make sure that I'm not going to go broke before I actually realize what I'm supposed to win. So I thought if I'm going to talk about risk management, I should probably go myself talk to someone who I know is an expert in this. So I went and talked to this guy, Jeff Yass. He's the founder of Susquehanna International Group, which is a very large uh, quantitative trading firm in financial markets. He's been doing this really successfully since the early 80s. So I figured, here's a guy who's been managing risk for you know, over 30 years, and he probably has a lot to say about it that would be very helpful as I'm coming to talk to you guys about risk. So I said, Jeff, I want to talk to you about risk, and I want to talk to you about risk management. And his response was, Risk Smith. And I thought, well, that's not very helpful. I really wasn't expecting him to say that. But he followed it with this. The biggest risk you have is that you have a losing strategy when you think you have a winning one. And I realized, oh, this guy really does know what he's talking about. And what he just said is actually very, very deep. Because here's the fundamental problem that we all face as we're out making decisions in this world. We live in an ambiguous world, right? Things are uncertain. Uh, pretty much everything that we engage in has uncertainty. Even things you think aren't particularly uncertain. Even things you think don't really have risk. So I like to talk about, you know, uh, if you take a shower, there's actually quite a bit of risk in that. Not as much as there used to be, but when I was growing up, all the plumbing was connected. So if someone in the house flushed the toilet, scalding hot water would come down on you and burn you. But you didn't have any control over that, right? So there was a little bit of risk involved in that, right? Some things have a lot of risk involved in them, but everything has a little bit of risk involved in them. We live in this ambiguous world where there's kind of this combination of luck, right? Stuff that kind of happens that you don't have a lot of control over, and skill, things that you actually have control over, your own decision making, right? Uh, and here's the second part of the problem. We all want to think we're awesome. So here's this thing, right? Uh, we all want to think that we're great at what we do. We all want to think we're really good decision makers and we're super smart and we're smarter than other people and we're going to succeed more than other people and we have a winning strategy. Because we want, we have this drive to constantly be updating our self-image in a positive way. Why do we do that? Well, actually, there's some great work that's been done in psychology on this. I highly recommend you look at the work of Roy Baumeister, who you might have heard. He does a lot of the work on willpower that's become very popular, about willpower being a muscle. But he also did some work um, in this particular area about why do we self-delude that we're awesome. And it turns out that we do better in the gene pool if we are actually delusional about how great we are. When we present a confident image to other people, we do better in terms of the mate that we can actually get. So this seems to be very wired in to the way we think. So we really always want to be avoiding any kind of negative uptake to our self-image and seeking out positive updates to our self-image. So that brings me to this guy. This guy is a guy named Phil Helmuth. He's a very, very, very famous poker player. He's known as the poker brat. He's a lot of world championships, and one day on TV, he gave me the greatest gift ever by saying, if it weren't for luck, I'd win every one. Now, obviously, what he's saying is if there weren't this uncertainty, my decision-making is so great, and I'm so better than everybody else at the decisions that I make at the poker table that no one else would ever be able to win a game. So whenever I lose, it's because I got unlucky. Now, he happened to have said that out loud, but the fact is that most of us think that pretty much all of the time. And what you see is this pattern 
in terms of how we deal with good outcomes and bad outcomes, right? How do we deal when we win versus when we lose? And we have this pattern. It turns out that we attribute our good outcomes to good decisions, right? So poker players say, wow, I played really well. That's why I won. And it turns out that we do the opposite when we have bad outcomes and we attribute it to bad luck. <laughs> Man, I can't believe this. I got so unlucky. And this is incredibly robust as a phenomenon. In fact, it's called the self-serving bias. It's pretty well studied. Uh, there's some good work, actually, someone forwarded to me recently by Rob McCow, but, but this was originally uh, worked on, I think, by Nesbitt. And uh, I, I know that I see this all over the place. So I have teenagers. And my teenage son, as far as I can tell, has never come home with a C where it wasn't the teacher's fault because the test was way too hard. And in fact, the teacher actually picks him out because he specifically doesn't like him. And if I have any doubts about that, I just have to go ask everybody in his class. <laughs> but strangely enough, whenever he gets an A, he did great on the test because he studied so hard and he wrote the world's best essay. And we can see this in terms of uh, people's promotions, right? Like you never see someone get a pr who doesn't get a promotion where it was ever their fault. It's always that the other guy schmoozed the boss, right? So um, I can imagine that you can think of lots and lots of examples of this particular pattern. I'm sure not in any of you, but in your friends. <laughs> so what's happening here is this idea of uncertainty, which is really where risk stems from, is allowing us an excuse to kind of ignore the bad outcomes in our life, right? What we do is we're always trying, because the world is uncertain, to separate the signal from the noise. And you can think about stuff that happens because of luck is noise, right? That's just because we live in a noisy world. And stuff that happens because of our own decisions is due to signal. So what do we do? When we have good outcomes, we say, aha, that's signal. And we, when we have bad outcomes, we say, oh, that's just noise. I'm going to ignore that. Now, it actually gets a little worse. Because it turns out that people will go another level deep into blaming risk for the fact that they might have a bad outcome and be losing, where what they do is still, because you know, we all want to think really well of ourselves, they still attribute good outcomes to good decisions. But now what they do is they attribute bad outcomes to poor risk management. Now this gets to the heart of what Jeff Yass was saying about risk smisk. Because what's happening here is that Somebody's sort of trying to be honest. They're saying, well, I know that all my bad outcomes aren't really due to luck. But it's as if they want to say, like, well, I still don't want to question whether I'm winning or losing, because that would feel really bad to me if I felt that my strategy wasn't winning. So let me look around for something that's kind of more, or at least feels more intellectually honest, to actually blame this on. And what they do is they blame it on risk management. So a poker player who goes broke doesn't go broke because they're a bad player and they actually have a losing strategy. They go broke because they play too high or they bet too much. If you think about uh, a startup, for example, how many of you have ever heard a startup uh, that went broke where the people who founded the startup says, you know what, my idea was terrible. There was no way I was ever going to do well with that idea. That's rare. <laughs> what they generally say is I didn't raise enough capital, I didn't have enough runway, right? So that's a risk management issue, right? Like I didn't have enough money for the bet that I was making, right? And if you listen to the dialogue around the 2009 financial crisis, which we just heard about, what, we, what did we hear from the banks, right? I bet too big. Or my risk management was awful. What you'd never heard from a bank was, you know what? We had a losing strategy. And if we kept applying that losing strategy as we did, we were inevitably going to go broke, and that's exactly what happened. What you heard instead was, oh, our risk management department needs to get better. We need to learn to manage our risk better. Now, I'm not saying that no poker player ever went broke because they didn't bet too big. I'm not saying that no startup ever went broke because they actually didn't have enough capital, but they had the world's greatest idea. And I'm certainly not saying that all of the banks that have ever gone broke didn't go broke because they didn't have a good risk management department. But what I know is it's not all of them. And it's almost 100% of them that will use this as a way to sort of reason around actually getting down deep into this foundational assumption about whether you actually have a winning strategy or not. Because we don't like to go there. It doesn't feel good to us. So this is really an example of motivated reasoning, which is 
very well studied. You can, there's a great description of it in a book called Kluge by Gary Marcus. Dan Cahan uh, has done a lot of work in it as well. Um, I recommend that you read up on it. And basically, this is a cognitive bias where we tend to only pay attention to evidence that confirms our foundational beliefs or whatever our beliefs are. And we actively work to discredit disconfirming evidence. And notice this pattern allows us to do that, right? The way that we think about risk actually allows us to avoid digging down deep into that foundational belief that we are awesome. We don't have to examine it because whenever we win to something, we use it as confirming evidence that we're awesome and that our decisions are great. And when we lose, we use risk as a way to disconfirm the evidence that might be suggesting otherwise. So, just to sum up what the problem is that Jeff was talking to me about, we all want to think we're awesome. Risk is a very convenient way to avoid examining this foundational belief that we're awesome. So, I agree with him. Risk, risk. So I'm just going to leave you with this quote from E.B. White of Charlotte's Web fame. Luck is not something you can men mention in the presence of a self-made man. Thank you.